Aside from that problem, the book of Acts claims that Abraham purchased this burial tomb in Shechem. If you've been to the land of Israel, you'll know that Shechem, which is today called Nablus, is not anywhere near where Abraham actually purchased this burial plot, which was in a place called Hebron, Kiryat Arba, not anywhere near Shechem. And yet the book of Acts says that the burial plot was in Shechem. Our Bible says in Genesis 23, 19, and other places it was in Hebron. And finally, the Christian Bible says that Abraham purchased this plot from Hamor. And our Bible says in Genesis 23, 17, and chapter 50, verse 13, that Abraham purchased the burial plot from Ephron the Hittite. So here they've managed to mangle a story from our Bible three places pretty quickly. Now let's get back to the Septuagint just for a moment. Why in the world would a Christian feel comfortable saying to us with a straight face, well, the New Testament writers relied upon the Greek translation of the Hebrew in the Septuagint. Why would they be comfortable saying that? You know, one of the few times the Christian Bible got it right, one of the few times, is in the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 2. You don't have it on your sheets in front of you. But Paul says in the book of Romans, to the Jewish people were entrusted the oracles of God. That's one of the few places the New Testament gets it right. Paul is saying that God entrusted the transmission of the Holy Scriptures to the Jewish people. The Jewish people never preserved the Bible in its Greek translation. I've been to hundreds of yeshivot and bate midrashot in the world. I've never been to a Beit Midrash where they have a Septuagint. I've never seen one in a Beit Midrash. Because for us as Jews, that was not in the way in which we preserved the Bible. As a matter of fact, for us, the translation of the Bible into Greek was something we didn't want to do. We were forced into doing it. And the rabbis actually pr- they pronounced that the day on which it took place should be a fast day. The eighth day of Tevet, it's going to be next week, was a fast day that the rabbis made to commemorate this horrible event when the Bible was translated into Greek. We do not celebrate that event. And so when we transmitted the Bible, it was always in the Hebrew text. Why would we be interested in a Greek translation of the Bible when God did not speak to Moses or the prophets in Greek? He spoke to them in Hebrew, in Lashon HaKodesh. So how could the Christians say to us with a a straight face, well, these irregularities in the New Testament are because the New Testament writers were relying upon the Septuagint? That's an answer? Who cares about the Septuagint? Why does it have any credibility, more credibility, than the actual Hebrew text? Now, there's a whole story behind how the Septuagint came to be written, and the truth of the matter is, it's a book that is of very poor quality control. The truth is that the Jews that were forced into translating it only translated the five books of Moses. You see this in the Gemara and Megillah. The Talmud Megillah speaks about this story. Josephus mentions this. There's a letter of Arastias that mentions it, meaning that we were not responsible for putting together the whole Bible in a Greek translation. And we never preserved this translation. And one of the proofs that we never preserved it is the Talmud in Megillah gives you a number of textual emendations that the rabbis made when they translated the Bible from Hebrew into Greek. If you get your hands, I have one here on our present day Septuagint. It doesn't have any of these textual emendations because it was the church that preserved the Septuagint and it was done very sloppily. Even the church fathers negated the credibility of this book. So the fact that they have to run to it to to solve problems in the text is not impressive, and we'll see that in most cases it doesn't solve the problem anyway. All right. 
Regarding the uh, burial place of Abraham, we're just going to quickly look at this because it's not really that big of a deal, but um, just to show you, when you Google questions like this, there's a lot of resources available. I don't know this place, or, but it's called Contradicting Bible Contradictions, and it's sorting out Bible contradictions. Who bought the sepulcher in Shechem from the sons of Hamar? All right, so here's the scriptures they, they bring out. Is uh, Abraham, uh, Genesis 50, 13. For his sons carried him, Jacob, to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, which Abram had bought along with the field for a burial site from Ephraim the Hittite. So this suggests that Abraham had bought two fields or two burial places, one in Hebron and one in Shechem. Okay? And then if you look at Acts chapter 7 verse 16, from there our fathers were removed to Shechem and laid the tomb which Abraham had purchased for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor and Shechem. So this is where the contradiction seems to happen. But up here in Genesis 50, they're saying that there's two purchases. One from Machpelah before Mamre, and then another one from Ephron the Hittite, which would be the one in Hebron. Where, which is the burial place of Abraham and Sarah and Isaac. Um, now, if you look at Jacob, Genesis 33, and he, Jacob, bought a piece of land where he had pitched his tent from the hand of the sites of Hamor, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money. Uh, Gen Joshua 24, 32. This is when the children of Israel took the bones of Joseph back to Israel when they during the Exodus. And they buried the bones of Joseph, which the sons of Israel brought up from Egypt at Shechem, in the piece of ground which Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamar, the father of Shechem. Okay? So... It seems to be a great problem for the critics of the Bible that Stephen mentioned a tomb near the city of Shechem that Abraham bought. While in the book of Joshua, Jacob is said to have brought, bought a burial place near Shechem. How is that to be explained? Was it Abraham or was it Jacob who bought it? John Wesley, which is a, an, a, a Protestant scholar from, oh, when would he be from? Um, the 17th century or, or, or 18th century um, but way back when anyway uh, he founded the Wesleyan church this is an old problem so John Wesley seems to be confused about it as well and John Wesley's answer was Saint Stephen in the book of Acts contracts the two purchases into one. So they're saying even John Wesley got it wrong. Um, now Genesis 50, 13, we are told that Jacob died in Egypt, was brought to Canaan and buried in the grave near Hebron. The sepulcher had been bought by his grandfather Abraham. This is natural to suppose that this was the place he bought for Sarah, for the burial of Sarah. Acts 7.16, it is said here that the fathers, the founders of the tribes of Israel, who all died in Egypt, which would be the twelve sons of Jacob, they were brought to Canaan to be buried there after their death. That happened in the burial place near the city of Shechem, not Hebron. This burial place had been bought by Abraham 
And there is no reason to make a problem of that, as Abraham, being the head of a great clan, was in need of several burial places in Canaan. The term the fathers means the sons of Jacob, the founders of the twelve tribes. Only Joseph is excluded. His body was embalmed and remained in Egypt because of his high position in Egypt in politics. So this is what they're saying. They're saying there's three burial places. Abraham bought a burial place in Hebron, a resting place for the bodies of Sarah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham bought a second burial place near Shechem, which became the resting place for the bodies of Jacob's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, but not Joseph. And then Jacob bought a piece of land near Shechem that became the burial place for Joseph. So there is no Bible contradiction in Acts 7.16, but it is rather disappointing that Christians are so quick to lend their ears to critics instead of simply reading and believing the text. Okay, so, you know, that's it's kind of complicated, and you can raise up a whole debate over this. But do we really care? <laughs> I don't. Okay, it's not it's not that important to me, but uh, if you really want to get into the nitty gritty, there's a good starting point to 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 start the debate. Um, so let's get on the bigger and better things. So I think uh, this next part here, we're going to talk about the providence of God. So what is providence? Providence is seeing, looking ahead and providing for what will come in the future. That's providence. So uh, the providence of God, the, Septuag the Septuagint Bible is actually very important in history. The, um, the, the idea, if you look at the Old Testament prophets, um, I'm not going to get into digging up all the scriptures, but there's this there's this general idea that the Jews are going to be made jealous by a different people, and that the Jews are going to be put into a state of blindness and dumbness, and that through their blindness we are healed. You know this kind of idea. And that there's a death and resurrection of the Jewish nation. Just as with uh, God, there seems to be a death and resurrection associated with uh, almost everything, or maybe everything. So, this Jewish, um, the Jewish language just about vanished. It was almost gone. Um, it was held only by a few rabbis. Few people in the world knew even what it was. Um, even today, there's a lot of uh, Jewish people who, from other countries mostly, who have, um, they can recite entire Tanakh from front to, to from beginning to end. They, they can sing the entire book in a song, but they have no idea what the song means. They just they can sing it perfectly, so this is a problem where um, the 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 Hebrew language was near to extinction at one point in history, and it was brought back. Um, now, who brought it back, and how was it brought back is the question. Now we have a term that we say the Rosetta Stone. And the Rosetta Stone is an actual stone that is held in Rosetta, Italy. And uh, I, th I can't remember what languages it has. I think it has the Egyptian uh, language and the Greek language. So it's the same story on, written on the stone in two different languages. And that stone, because scholars knew the Greek language, 
it allowed them to decipher the Egyptian language. And that's a Rosetta Stone. So after that, any, any um, example of a translated text that we find from ancient history that allows us to gives us a tool to help us translate an unknown text is known as a Rosetta Stone. So the Septuagint Bible became a Rosetta Stone for the Hebrew. Even today, Hebrew scholars will refer to the Septuagint because it was a, translated in 300 BC from Hebrew to Greek. And now they know Greek. Greek is a well-known language, even ancient Greek. So when they take this translation from Hebrew to Greek, and then they compare that with the Hebrew, and how the Hebrew can be translated, how the, how the Greeks translated it, and how we translate it, and they compare all these things, they learn more about it. So. Um, every Hebrew scholar will, will have the Septuagint Bible in his toolbox because it's so important for that. Now, how else was the Septuagint important to history? Well, in Western Europe, the Roman Catholic, the Holy Roman Empire, they had the Latin Vulgate and they had the catechisms. Now when the Muslims overran Constantinople and the Byzantine Greek Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, when they got pushed out, they got pushed north into Russia and also into Western Europe. Um, they, through their whole history, had used the Greek Septuagint as their Hebrew text and they were Christians and so they had also the New Testament written in Greek and as that uh, Bible became modernized because scribes like the old manuscripts wear out because they were used and the old scribes would keep copying it into new manuscripts and as the language changed, they would update the manuscripts with the language so that people could understand it. And so naturally, the Septuagint became the Hebrew go-to manuscript for these scribes. And now what's important is that when the Byzantine manuscripts, which there are thousands of them, they moved, they were brought into Western Europe. And the, the scholars in Western Europe, uh, particularly this one named Erasmus, he made a, a parallel Bible. It might be the first parallel Bible that we know of, where he had the Latin Vulgate on one column, and right beside it, the uh, Greek text, on another column where you could compare them and they found parts especially related to the deity of Mary um, parts that uh, they felt had been altered that it did not agree with the Greek Byzantine text the Latin text and um, this started a, a whole controversy and um, the Protestants um, who eventually broke away started starting really with Martin Luther, a German, uh, a German Catholic priest and theologian who uh, tried to reform the Catholic Church but was excommunicated and ended up starting a different church and that's sort of beginning of the Protestant churches. Uh, well he, uh, the Protestants picked up the work of Erasmus and the Greek text because they mistrusted the Latin Vulgate. And they said, well, let's look to the Byzantine Greek text and, and see 
they were scholars and they knew Greek pretty well. Let's see if you know what we can glean from that and find out like what was the true text at the beginning? What was the author scripts? Um, so that's where the scholarship began to to try to get back to the auth author manuscripts of the New Testament and the Old Testament at the time. It was it was in the Latin Vulgate. It was also in the Greek for the Byzantine texts. And eventually, um, the Hebrew language was just among rabbis. Rabbis were the only ones who really could speak it or know it. And it wasn't a well-known thing. It was almost extinct. Um, now, I'm taking Hebrew right now in, in uh, school online school and um, I've been at it for a while now um, and I'm taking it f from a place in Israel and a lot of my professors are Jewish and some of them are Christian also and some of them are Messianic Jews maybe there's there's a variety of, of uh, beliefs between Christian and Jew in this school learning Hebrew and um, the text that they, or the books that they are introducing me to, this is a Jewish school learning Hebrew. This is the number one book that they introduced me to. Brown Driver Briggs Lexicon of the Hebrew text. So, and also this book here. Jesenius Hebrew Grammar. This is the reference book for Hebrew grammar of ancient Hebrew, biblical Hebrew. So, who's Jesenius? Okay, I had to write some of this stuff down. Jesenius, Wilhelm Jesenius, is a German scholar. He published this in 1810, Hebrew Grammar, and this is still this is a very, very complicated book. He talks about the pronouns, participles, plurals, nouns, uh, how sentences are structured. You know, it's all grammar. And he published this in 1810. He was uh, associated with the University of Helmstedt and also Göttingen which are German universities. This, this was originally written in German. It was translated later on into English. Um, now these are Lutheran, Lutheran schools in Germany. So it's a Lutheran Christian translating or, or writing a book about Hebrew grammar because they're interested in getting back to the original Hebrew. What does the original, they had the original Hebrew manuscripts from the Jews, but nobody knows what it means. Nobody can translate it, or very few people. And very few people are willing to translate it. So they're digging, and there's a lot of uh, Jews in Germany also at that time. And they're, they're digging to build a an understandable, system of grammar to understand the ancient Hebrew language. And then later on, this book, it's like a dictionary. It's a Hebrew-English lexicon. And this is a huge body of work. Like you see that they've gone through, you know, every, every Hebrew word and you can read about what it means, which is a little bit complicated sometimes. Um, now, this Brown Driver Briggs, this was done by three men, okay? Uh, Francis Brown, okay, he's associated with Hamilton College in Clinton, New York, and Dartmouth in Hanover, New Hampshire. Um, now, these are uh, New England Christian colleges. Uh, Dartmouth was founded even before the American Revolution. 
It was uh, to train ministers to uh, evangelize the native people in America um, in Christian in Christianity. So that's uh, Mr. Brown, uh, Mr. Driver Samuel Driver. He went to Winchester College and New Oxford College and Christ Church in Oxford in England. These, these are doctors of divinity and doctors of theology, these guys, okay? The top level theologians. Um, this book was first published in uh, 1910, okay? And also Mr. Briggs, Charles Briggs, he was a Presbyterian. Protestant. Um, he's associated with the universe, University of Virginia in Charlottesville, Virginia, um, and the Union Theological Seminary in New York. These are Christian universities. Okay, so these Christian scholars. Um, now, Mr. Briggs, he actually stood trial for heresy because he pointed out translation errors in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, English In the English translation there's errors and he pointed out some errors and some other things and he was uh, he stood trial for heresy for that in New York. So um, this is the truth about the Hebrew language. Here, Here's the authority the authoritative book, the, the, the authoritative book on ancient Hebrew language are Christian books. They're Christians, okay? And how did they get this authority? How did they get all this information? Well, the Setiguant had a lot to do with it because it was a Greek translation of the Hebrew text from 300 B.C. So that looks back, right back to even before Jesus, to um, what did they translate it as? Now, the Septuagint obviously has a lot more, there's a lot of tradition added into it. It's almost like they layered other books in with it. But it's got the exact same um, text with other things added. So in the text where there isn't other things added, where it's the exact same as the Tanakh, the entire Tanakh is in there, but it has extra stuff. So where the Tanakh is and how it was translated into Greek teaches us a lot. It's like a Rosetta Stone. It teaches us a lot about Hebrew grammar and the meaning of Hebrew words. And also there's the... Um, the, the Talmud, which is the, uh, it was an oral history, but was written down, uh, I'm not sure when, but somewhere about the thousand BC, a thousand AD, it was written into books. And it was, it's a Jewish oral history of the teachings of the rabbis. And so the rabbis are teaching, uh, they're teaching about the, the Tanakh. And so where they're teaching about a certain word or a certain sense, sentence, we can see what they said about what that word means. And, and we can see what they said about what that sentence means. And so there's another source of like, like uh, uh, Rosetta Stone also to look back at the Hebrew language through their eyes. And when you compare that with the Septuagint, and you look at the, now we have the Dead Sea Scrolls also, is, was it discovered in the 1940s. And there's another example, a great example of many Hebrew texts. So through all these things is how scholars today can understand the Hebrew language. And there still is work to be done. It's not complete. Um, but it's very good. It's very close to understanding it very completely. Um, so for this guy to sit there and 
So it's our text and uh, we don't like the subtuguent. We even have a day of not liking it. It's like, you know, you wouldn't even be here. It's God's providence that brought this about. The, the, the subtuguent and the loss of the language. Now the whole world is coming together to try to figure out what this Bible means. Without all those events and without the Septuagint, nobody would care. Who would care? I mean, you're going to sit there and whine about your, your somebody else is reading your book. Um, you know what? That's, a, that's if, if everybody listened to you and did what you wanted, nobody would care. Who would care about it? Nobody. And nobody cares about the grave thing. Very few people do. I don't. And it, it's the more bigger picture. We care more about the bigger picture. And about what the original text actually means. And what is it trying to tell us. The, these are the important things. So, you know, this rabbi, the way he's going on and, and whining about this little stuff... I mean, he doesn't always do it, but here he is. And, and now he's got this big thing against the Septuagint, without which the Hebrew language would likely be extinct today. But today we have a whole nation of Israel. We have, you know, it's, it's a modern language also now. But the, the ancient language is the same language, but it's sort of like uh, Shakespeare is to English. It's an older version, uh, more complicated maybe. Okay, I don't know why that ended up getting cut off where it was, but uh, rant over. Uh, thank you for watching. Um, please like, share, subscribe, and all that stuff with the video. And I'll see you next week.